Jeffrey Powell, Danielle, who have been recording. We have a YouTube channel now, isn't that exciting? You can see all of us on, uh, on that platform, Creative Life Spiritual Center. Uh, there are 43 uh, subscribers at this point. Uh, but as I mentioned on Sunday, that's we're doing better on Facebook. We have 900 and some followers, but we're not doing as well as Costco rotisserie chickens, which have 13,000 followers. And we, we need to do better. Because the chickens don't post much. <laughs> so, okay, so what we're doing here tonight, especially for those of you who are new, newish with us, we have this group of people that are called licensed practitioners. We have, I think, 20 now, and several who are also ministers. More on that in a moment. And tonight we install three new ones who had all their training through us here at Creative Life and completed this uh, back in the summer. There's a battery of tests they had to go through and they did so successfully. And tonight we will welcome them, although they've been serving de facto for those months, we will welcome them officially into the family of religious science practitioners and present them with their actual licenses. Then when we're finished with that, we'll excuse everybody else and we have a private little thing that we do with them, which is the subject of a great many rumors and, and, and panic innuendo and stuff over the over the years what 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 exactly goes on there but it's a sweet and wonderful thing that came to us through Ann Richardson and uh, and youth camps years ago and Jan Govain and Jan Govain that's exactly right mm -hmm. and uh, we'll, we'll tell the story to the people who, who can hear it a little later we want it to be a surprise because you never know who amongst you is going to decide you want to do this and so when you come to that threshold in your life where you become a practitioner. You want to be surprised like Monty was before. Marissa, you know, they, they know. And they survived, and here they are, more or less the same as they were before. What a practitioner is is simply this. I'm a practitioner. I've been a practitioner. It'll be 36 years this fall. And, and then I became a minister. But all a minister is is a practitioner with some added responsibilities. That's the only difference. First, last, and foremost, I'm a practitioner. What does a practitioner do? They practice, hence the name. They're not called theoreticians, they're called practitioners. We practice, what is it we practice? Prayer, affirmative prayer, specifically a type of prayer called spiritual mind training. We are trained to meet the case using spiritual mind training. That's a fancy way of saying, no matter what happens, you look for the God in you look for the God in it. If it's alarming, there's God in it. If it's charming, there's God in it. If it's somewhere in between, there's God in it. You're trained to look for the God in it. As your second thought, your first thought is, oh, wow, or oh, my God, or, well, I mean, Carthel texted me today, OMG. You know what that means? And that meant, you know, I saw that and I kind of, and then my second thought was, and Marcia put it beautifully in words, God is right there in that situation, in that apparent um, decline or turning down of progress. God is right there in that situation. We, we had a, one Sunday, a woman here some years ago tripped on the sidewalk outside there and went splat. And everybody gathered around and half of the group went and to get her a chair on casters, not a wheelchair, but a chair, conference chair or something, get her up in a chair, you know, and make sure she was all right. And the other half treated. The other half did affirmative prayer. That's how it should work, okay? We lift the fallen and we dust them off. Meanwhile, we affirm that there's some part of them that hasn't failed. That's what a practitioner does. And these practitioners of creative life, they go through um, hundreds of hours of training and spend several thousands of dollars for the privilege of holding a credential that in the outside world means nothing. Right? Means nothing. 
it's, it's not an accredited degree, it's not something you can put on a resume, and anybody outside of this organization or organizations like it would know what in the world he's talking about. So why do they do this kind of thing? Because they want to help heal the world, they want to be of service to the world. The practitioners of creative life are involved in a great many things. They teach classes. This class, I've got an Emerson class that just ended today, we're starting an Emma Hopkins class next week. Ruth, whose phone battery, is this your phone, I guess I'm wearing out, is, uh, was assisting me with Emerson, will be assisting me with Hopkins. David Dewhurst will serve as the bridge in there. Practitioners teach on their own. They teach our kids on Sundays. And they pick up after everybody else. Practitioner will be the one who'll say, there's an empty coffee cup under that chair. This is my place and I take ownership, so let me pick it up. Practitioners feed us on the first Sunday of every month, but also around these special events, and musical shows and such that we have throughout the year. Our two, new pra two of our new practitioners specifically do that. Practitioners are the ones who, when um, a storm is coming, they're the first ones to say, Give me part of the phone list and I'll call a bunch of people, make sure they're all right. If you're hospitalized, and I urge you not to be, don't be hospitalized. But if you hypothetically were, you would look up from your hospital bed, and very likely what you would see there would be a practitioner looking down at you. And they don't have the meter running the whole time, you know? You're not going to get a bill from a practitioner. They're not going to bill your insurance or your Medicare or something for tens of thousands of dollars for showing up and doing the right thing. The only money they're ever gonna ask from you is if you want an hour of their undivided attention to sit down and have an actual appointment where you lay out all your hopes and goals and dreams and you make them sit there with you and then they pray about it. And that's only fair. And it's also pretty cheap. So they are really remarkable people. They are also, in this organization, the first ecclesiastical officers that we ever had. Long before we had ministers. You know why? Our founder didn't want a church. That's why he didn't want clergy. He said this is an augmentation to people's spiritual practice already. You turn it into a church, people trip out on that, and they think it's a replacement. So the first ecclesiastical officers, or what he called the, the healing arm of the church were the practitioners. I may have hung up on her. And his mother, are you there? Ruthie? I don't know. Oh, there she is. Okay, you're still there. Are you hearing, are you enjoying my droning on here? Yeah, I thought I was going to speak too. Okay, well, hang on, I got a little bit more to, more to do, and then we got some other people want to say hey, all right? All right, hang on. So without giving you a whole history of new thought, which if you're interested in, I'll be teaching in Denver twice this winter, and you can check it out by Zoom, but without giving you a whole history of new thought right now, this teaching was founded by a man named Ernest <coughs> Holmes who moved to California from Maine in the last years of the 19th century and began to teach and write in the first years of the 20th century. And when he pulled this teaching together, the very first practitioner that we had was a woman named Anna Holmes, his mother. She was the first. Later, he would marry a woman named Hazel and she would become a practitioner. And there have been wonderful practitioners all along who never went on to become ministers or work in a center or a church or do what they call pulpit work. There was a man named Homer Johnson who's a legend among practitioners who came to LA and, and rented an office in downtown Los Angeles and had a caseload, I mean basically a five day a week caseload of clients who believed that they could get some healing through him and did. That's how popular the teaching was in that place and at that time. And he had a style of prayer. He would say, when he was getting ready to start treatment, he would say, let's go upstairs. Or 
this storage state. So let's go to that upper room, that other place. So this is just a little bit about practitioners and what they do. And for everyone here tonight who's not one, they're here to serve you. Uh, so, but tonight is their night, so I don't expect them to serve you tonight. They're off tonight. This is, this is their night tonight, and we're going to have a special time with them and welcome them and give them their licenses. And as we do so, I'd like to invite the Reverend, hello, Marsha Lehman to come up, who is our coordinator of practitioners and our instructor in practitioner one and practitioner two. And if you can get past her, as you know, then you're in. leave me much time, Jesse. You have all the time you need. <laughs> I have all the time I need all and all the time, time I have. <laughs> just kidding. All the time. Kind of. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to mention the reason that I became a practitioner. I'm just going to step down here. Uh-oh. Oh. Is that going to mess you up? Okay. Um, I became a practitioner because I just wanted to know more about prayer. And being the slow student that I was, then I had to go to ministerial school <coughs> to learn more about prayer. And I don't regret it at all. I'm still learning more about prayer and practicing it is a part of my life that is so important. I have two prayer partners, not one, but two, because I really can use two. And I probably could use more than that. And I encourage each of you to have a prayer partner. The great thing about practitioners is um, when, when you're feeling like you just have hit a wall and you don't know where to go and things are stuck, then call a practitioner because they look beyond what you can see and they do prayer and they tell the truth about you and whatever it is in your life that you want to have changed. I love being in class with people who want to be practitioners. They are funny, they are open, they listen because that's what we do in class. We learn to listen to each other first and then we learn to listen to people who come to us who want to have their lives transformed. And there's a whole art to listening. And that's what they do. I, I'm looking at practitioners now. Lisa, of course, who opens us every Wednesday evening. And Tom, many times, will close us. And Tom was an excellent student in practitioner class. When I had <laughs> when I had them do um, some creative work with clay because the creative principle is so important in what we do, I still have a little picture of the uh, green bean with the beret, Tom, that <laughs> you made. <laughs> Linda, you remember, don't you? Yeah. When you're in class with other practitioners and you're learning together. There is something so very special. You know how it is in foundations class in heartfelt living. Well, practitioner takes you even beyond that with people that you love and who love you. Now, Anne is our practitioner emeritus. That means she's been a practitioner longer than God. <laughs> and she, <laughs> Whoa. she, it, I, I know if you've gone to Anne for prayer, you have really been listened to and you've noticed how your life has changed because of that. Yeah. And, and these other practitioners are so full of light and service. Marissa is helping us with the youth and she helps with, you name it, she helps. Linda is the same way and Monty and his beautiful partner teach and you know if we listed all the things that practitioners do around here we would be here uh, really longer than you want to tonight i think 
Sarah has just been such an inspiration to me because she not only listens, but you can see her mind working. She is always there in, in the classroom and in her teaching, questioning, being curious and wondering. And Danielle is like the smiling one and she never, ever misses a beat. When, when there is something up, Danielle is on it. And if it's in her life, she's on it. If it's in someone else's life, she's on it. She has prayer partner. Sarah has prayer partner. Do you have prayer partner? One. One? Okay, one will do. <laughs> and John Rennie back there has so much persistence. And he is our practitioner who skipped a year so he could come back and have a perfect score on his exams. <laughs> he did. So it's just, it's just such a, a wonderful time that we have together. Now, did I miss anybody? Oh, Cassius. Cassius will soon be a practitioner. <laughs> he just doesn't know it quite yet. So I think what we're going to do is um, ask practitioners to come up and speak for not more than three minutes because sometimes practitioners can get a little windy. We'll end with yes. Now the three new ones can speak for five minutes. <laughs> we won't. We won't time, but we, we won't time you, but. I'll be listening. <laughs> now, uh, let's see, who wants to go first? Monty, yes. Um, to our uh, new practitioners, uh, just a brief bit of advice. Um, when you're not sure what direction to go in mind or in treatment. Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, oh, the, the phone. Forgot the phone. Oh, um, return to a simpler form. When you need to return somewhere, return to a simpler form. This refrain that you hear, there is one life, one power. This by including this in so many classes and in so many services and in your own prayer work, it's, it's almost like when you need to go somewhere, you revert to your training. You go back and fall back on the basic principles that we learn first, that we learn again, that we learn perennially, and there is one life, and you can go to that life. Um, There's a power and intelligence in the world greater than you are, and you can use it. Um, Dr. Holmes was uh, dedicating a new center in California, and uh, it happened to be captured on uh, audio tape. And you can hear this. If you haven't yet, I hope you will soon. And in that dedication, he says there are only two reasons for a place like this teaching and practice. Those are the only two reasons. And yes, we have to pay the bills, we have to have some coffee, we have to have coordinators for this and that, but those are not the reasons why we're here. We're here for teaching and practice. So, welcome.
again, the spiritual mind treatment and also listening externally and internally. And through practicing this past year, I have definitely been able to listen deeper and that I really enjoy that part. And I can hear not the words to say, but the feelings to say, or I can take a, take a breath and put some silence in the treatment until I hear what the right forward moving word or energy to put into it is. And so that listening is something I've really enjoyed um, getting stronger. No blank space. Well, um, gosh, I don't know what to say except welcome to the family, those of you who have passed your test. And this family's growing by leaps and bounds. I know that it was purely selfish when I made the decision many long years ago to become a practitioner because I wanted to understand where this thing called prayer could take me in my life and the family I was with and, and just in the world in general. And um, what I've come to understand is that I continuously keep going inward. It's always breathing deeper and deeper into this place. And it amazes me that there's so much space inside there to explore and to be mindful at some point that it's really a different pace. And when I heard that one day, I thought it's a different pace of life. And I heard the mantra of it's a pace of love. It's always every person that comes to sit before you to pray with them uh, any situation in the world that you happen upon that no one's asking, but you know you're there to be a blessing, it's all a space of love that you show up, and that is a space. And so in my practice, I don't think the years, too much about that anyway, I, I think it really becomes much more of an this part of myself that just feels like I've extended myself into other people, into in the lives, not like an empath, but like an extension of what can be. So I'm grateful to be a practitioner today. My, I don't know where, how life could be without this, and I wouldn't want it to be. So next. fails. I shock myself. Okay. And then I'll proceed to shock you, maybe. No. Um, I'm in a study group right now, and we are doing Lessons in Truth with uh, Katie. Uh, I'm blanking on her first name right now. Emily. Emily Katie. Okay, thank you. Um, and last night in the group, one of the things that the uh, moderator was talking about was uh, how do you want to see God in the world? And that's the way I see practitioners, is that we model how we want to see God in the world. And so I invite you to think about that. For those of you who are new as practitioners and those of us who've been doing it for a while, uh, I was trying to do the math, and I'm either at nine or 10 years, I'm not sure. Um, but it definitely gives me I'm not gonna say pause, even though that is one of my favorite words, um, to stop and think as a practitioner, how do I wanna see God in the world? How can I be God in the world? 
and as my watchword always is, love. It invites me to be a more loving presence, even when I am being at my most human and stressed out. So I invite you into the love of being a practitioner. Welcome. So Lisa talked about love and in uh, talked about length of time and how she's enjoyed it. Um, when I first started, it was about curiosity. I wanted to see where it would go, where um, taking all the classes led me. So while Lisa welcomes you into love, I welcome you into curiosity and new practitioners because Curiosity can get you to very many interesting places. It can get you into some trouble, <laughs> but curiosity leads you to some of us here. Um, and I find that it's, it's curiosity leads you to some of the more fantastic adventures you may have in your life. Um, Lisa took curiosity about going to be a minister. Well, um, I kind of, by proxy of that, being a new practitioner, I got to follow her ministerial journey while I was being a brand new practitioner. It was a lot of fun, a lot of stress, but we both learned a lot. So enjoy your time. Be curious, explore what makes you, makes your life fun and interesting. Because as Jesse constantly goes through new series, there's always books out there that are curious, draw your attention. Jesse's always talking about something new that's interested him. And that's the way it should be as a practitioner, because that's how we show God in the world. Welcome, new practitioners. I have the privilege of taking uh, most of your courses with you and loved you from the very moment uh, went in and knew that just in the first handful of weeks that y'all were the most amazing, beautiful practitioners. Uh, you had the heart for it, the mind for it, and the spirit for it. Thomas was the little brother in my practitioner class. There was all of us older women and, you know, and Thomas. <laughs> so we, um, he was our official little brother and loved him to pieces as well. I love being a practitioner. I uh, took a course, I, you know, because I took all the courses and it just seemed the next logical step to take. I um, love creative life. And I love all of you that come and participate and make up our, our spiritual living center family. I love Jesse and I love Marsha and no two greater people to, um, that serve uh, us. And um, I always wanted to, well, let me say, I, I love being a practitioner because I love this center and I love serving this center in any shape, fashion, and form that I can. I also have a problem with my speaking because I get really extremely nervous. And my running theme through it was one day I'm gonna talk pretty. Uh, I'm still waiting for that. But um, there are, when you are practicing your um, spiritual mind treatment, whether it be over the phone, whether it be face to face, whether it's in the solace and solitude of your own home. There is only talking pretty because you feel the love. You feel 
everything that goes into being a practitioner. And with that being said, I love y'all and welcome and we are so much better for it. Thank you. I think I'm the new, I think we got all the ongoing practitioners. I want to start out with a synchronicity. Jesse's been using the work of Leonardo da Vinci as the thread through his Wednesday and Sunday talks. Leonardo was left-handed in a time when it was almost dangerous, but he fought it. The synchronicity is all three new practitioners are left-handed. <laughs> 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 I'm going to talk about how I got here and where I'm going. Um, I spent 26 years in the Catholic Church when my wife and I decided to get married a little over 50 years ago. We moved into the Episcopal Church because she was a Presbyterian and we felt we should be together. And that lasted until the mid-70s and we sort of all drifted off. In 1986, I had an event that led me to know there's a God. And it wasn't until 2003 when Nancy and I were in Santa Barbara with a friend who belonged to the Santa, Santa Barbara, no, excuse me, Santa Rosa. She, she was in Santa Rosa. For the Santa Rosa uh, Religious Science Church. And she had Science of Mind magazine. And here I am from the magazine, to listening to Sunday talks on the internet, to getting Jesse's talks on CD, to taking classes, all the way through being, becoming a practitioner. And I have been in the intellectual part of the world since I guess I was able to read. And it's continued now in studying science of mind. But what has come along with the, particularly with the courses, but, but also starting before that, is another thing that's happened with me. I've opened up my heart and I'm continuing to work on that. Where I'm going from here is I have three prayer partners to work with, people from uh, that I've had as prayer partners in Crack 2. Um, Marissa and Brenda Horning started a call-in on Thursday evening for meditation and prayer. And um, I've been involved in that and when I became a practitioner, became one of the three practitioners working on that. And I invite you to join us at 7 p.m. Central Time uh, tomorrow night and every Thursday we're there and we, we would like clients and the way to connect is listed in the newsletter that Jesse sends out every week. The third thing I'm involved in um, and I only am here twice a year because I live in Knoxville, Tennessee I have a study group there, a New Thought study group. There is not a religious science church in Knoxville. The closest one is Asheville, North Carolina, which is two hours away. Um, there is an independent group that's the, the combining of a religious science international and a unity church. And there's a unity church. And I'm working with both of those uh, for the study group. We will soon be on Zoom, and uh, it's Monday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, because I live in the Eastern Time Zone, which some people call God's time, but we won't bring that up. <laughs> and look for the announcement in the newsletter for that, and uh, you'd be welcome.
welcome to that. And uh, that's it. I can tell you that I wanted to be a practitioner from almost day one of coming to the center. Um, I can remember that very first Sunday morning. I remember the first people I met, the Manskis. Yeah. I remember what Jesse was talking about, the Greek muses, and I did come back. <laughs> and um, I remember how I felt reading along to the lyrics of I love myself the way I am. And I was so touched. I knew I wanted to be here. I couldn't learn that song fast enough. And I promise you, even tonight, those lyrics are on my refrigerator. <laughs> and I remember the practitioners. Um, Anne Richardson being one of them. Deb Miller, the McKenzies, Tammy Sheets. And they were like shining people to me. And when I started taking the classes, taking heartfelt living, reading the science of mind textbook, my heart, my life were changed for good. And I knew then, just as I know now, one of the services I want to provide as a practitioner, and I'll tell you, any of you can do this. You don't have to be a practitioner to do this, but as part of my service, I wanted and want to be that receptive person to people like me who took quite a while to get here, who journeyed quite a bit to get here, and found that this place, this unique place, was the place that fed my mind and my heart and my soul. <clears throat> you don't have to be a practitioner to change your life. I was changing my life before I became a practitioner, but I will tell you that even though I could point to circumstances that had shifted, so much of my growth, inner growth, has been as a practitioner and the on-the-job experience, so to speak, and a huge demonstration of mine has been that I am proud of what I do. I am proud of who I am in this role. And I am so grateful to be able to share this experience with you, to be able to share this journey with you. remember um, finding creative life because of course everything happens for a reason and there are no accidents I literally was driving by and this building called to me and from the second I walked through those doors I knew I was home this teaching the practice here the principles that we all share and love, it's so much more than a religion. It's so much more than just a church. This is a way of life that unless you live it, you can never fully understand and grasp. And that's why I love it so much and I know that I needed to do this. It was funny. When I was in Heartfelt Living, Ruth and Jesse both said, and I don't remember if it was like first or second week or something, you're gonna be a practitioner. <laughs> like, okay guys, whatever, that's cute to everything, but you know, and here I am. But you know, it was, this was meant to be. This was meant to be for me. This is where my whole life's journey has led to. And I know that, I believe that, I trust in that, 
and I am so grateful. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. And my favorite thing about being a practitioner is that I get to serve this community. I get to be a part of this each and every day, each and every week, and I love it. This place is so wonderful. The love, the warmth, the kindness, everything just, just embodies not only this building, but every single individual that walks through here. And I just, I'm very grateful that I'm a part of it. So thank you.